Elon Musk has referred to something called the woke mind virus. You want to reach someone who is infected by it, a friend, a family member, a colleague. How do you do it? Well, if you're to have any hope at all of reaching such a mind, you must first understand the way they think. You know, I've spent my career taking on some of the cultural baddies, you know, some of the most prominent intellectuals in the world, some of them in public debates, some of them behind the scenes. And I've come to realize that ideas define everything that we do. With an academic degree, you're trained to be a researcher and writer to the point that it's annoying. I mean, but I'm grateful for it. I'm not talking about books I've not read. I'm not talking about papers I've not read. Whether I agree with them or not actually isn't the point. Uh, there are quite a few books that I would read that I would say are actually evil books. Donald Trump, when he was in a divorce with his first wife, she said he has a copy of Mein Kampf next to his bed. I wish more people did. If the German people had bothered to read that book rather than just have it on their shelf, we might have avoided the Holocaust. If more people read the Quran, they'd be wiser to what Islam actually is, what they actually believe. If people bothered to read, as I have, the writings of Klaus Schwab and the various contributors to the World Economic Forum and the ideas that are driving the globalists, I read them because I want to understand their mentality. I cut out the middleman. I go straight to the ideology. Everything in your life is being defined by either your ideas or the ideas of the people around you. And each episode, we're going to be digging into a different idea that appears in the culture. This is Ideas Have Consequences with me, Larry Alex Taunton. Hey, are you in the box? No, So these are climate activists blocking an interstate in Rome. Um, this is fairly tame, woke kind of stuff relative to some of the other things that we can all see floating around on social media. It might be um, an elderly person being attacked. It might be people spray painting the side of a building, you know. Uh, with messages like stop big oil now or stop drilling or stop fracking or whatever. But it's a glimpse to you of individuals who are totally sold out to an idea and they don't care what level of disruption or problems they might cause in the lives of ordinary people. So in today's podcast, in today's Ideas Have Consequences, podcast, we're trying to understand what's going on in the heads of people like this. We're trying to understand the woke mind. It's important to have a Christian worldview. The question becomes, how do we build that? How do we develop that? Oftentimes we have Bible teachers who are very faithful in teaching scripture, but don't ever quite make the connection with the outside world. Other times we have Bible teachers who don't really want to touch certain topics because they're just seen to be too toxic. At tomap.com, you are going to find a wide range of issues being addressed to help you build out that Christian worldview. They're on things from, from suffering, uh, dealing with mental health to racial reconciliation. These are all issues that you will find at tomap.com and they'll help you to build out a Christian worldview and to flourish. 
I hope you learn a lot from the podcast, but you can go beyond the podcast to the courses that we offer at Tome. So I hope you'll take a look at them and sign up. To get access to more than 100 Tome courses, use the code IDEAS. And for $8.25 a month, you can get access to all kinds of courses on a wide variety of subjects. Individuals with expertise, with experience in subjects that will be meaningful to you. So use the code IDEAS and for $8.25 a month, you can get access to all of them. Go to tomap.com. Back to the podcast. By this, I mean people. When I'm talking about woke people, I think most of you know what this means, but there's almost always somebody in the comments who says, what do you mean by woke? We're talking about people who seem prepared to acquiesce to whatever absurd policy or practice is being promoted at any given moment by the radical left. But they don't just simply acquiesce to it. They seem to be prepared to believe it and to defend it. It could be mask mandates. It could be lockdowns. It could be mandatory vaccines. It could be the war in Ukraine, irreversible sex change surgeries for adolescents, abortion, or hating whoever or whatever the left directs them at. And I want to be clear that the way the left works on these kinds of issues, we were talking about this with Saul Alinsky, with Marx, with Gramsci, with um, Lukash, others that we've discussed on this program. At bottom, their secret sauce, as it were, is about creating victims. It's about creating victims, convincing people that they are victims. As I've said to you before on this podcast, you convince people of almost nothing. <laughs> If you've ever had a conversation just, just about sports with a friend or a colleague or a family member with whom you disagree, much less on politics or religion, I don't care what facts you bring to the table. You can convince people of almost nothing except that they're victims. People are prepared to believe that they're victims. It's, it's in us. It's easy to convince us someone has taken advantage of us, that our failures are not our own failures. They're someone else's fault. And that's their secret sauce, is creating victims, the, the victim mentality. And that's part of what's going on in the woke mind. And we're going we're gonna to discuss this just a little bit today. These are people who seem to be prepared to become, not seem to be, but are prepared to become militant. It's not just simply, it's okay if you want to wear a mask. I personally am of the view, if you want to wear one, wear one. I'm not critical of you uh, for wearing one. I'm critical of you when you try to make me wear one. Not critical of you if you choose to have the vaccine. Not critical of you, I disagree with you, if you think the war in Ukraine is you know, something we should be doing. You're free to have your own opinions. But see, I'm free to have mine too. And the, in the woke mindset, they're utterly intolerant of disagreement. You must agree with them. So these are individuals who are driven by this. And because they believe so strongly in victimhood, either their own or someone else's, they're prepared to hate whomever or whatever the left directs them at. And again, part of the secret sauce here is if I can make you, if I can convince you that you're a victim, I can then weaponize you against that person or thing that I've convinced you has victimized you. I can make you, so, so if you're black and I convince you that all the difficulties in your life are caused by white people, I can gradually warp your mind so that you're prepared to hate all white people. If you're white, and I convince you that black people are all, same thing, and it moves in, in either direction. Uh, you can convince people of victimhood. So we're, we're going to try to get, get down to what's going on in the woke mind. And to show you how absurd it is that these people... The, the rank and file of the woke masses, of the woke mob, of the woke mafia, are prepared to believe almost anything. Here's a headline from CNN. And at first I thought, is this Babylon B? 
is this the onion? Surely it must be. It can't be real. But no, it is. It is for real. It's from CNN.com. They put out this tweet that says it shows a freighter. You know how big those things are. You know, a, a, an enormous cargo ship, you know, just loaded with, um, with containers. And it says giant kites could pull cargo ships across the ocean and slash their carbon emissions. <laughs> and it shows this cargo ship with what looks like, um, you know, a parachute of the type that somebody who's, you know, parasailing or something would use. And I thought, you know, CNN seems to think that whoever they've been in discussion with about this story has invented sailing. <laughs> I mean, that's what they're talking about. You know, giant kites have been done before. It's called sailing. We gave this up roughly, you know, other than for fun, we gave this up roughly, oh, the end of the 19th century, beginning of the early 20th century, because we discovered steam was more efficient. But here they are with this crazy picture, giant kites, sails, could pull cargo ships across the ocean. And I'm sure that there are some young people, and they're usually young, who are uh, part of the ranks of the woke mafia who will see this as a wonderful innovation and advancement um, in human civilization it's for the planet. But they're prepared to believe this kind of stuff. It doesn't matter what's coming down to them. Lopping off the penises of children seems to make sense to some people. See, and you're wondering, what's going on in the heads of people like this? This week, a friend of mine asked me, he says, Larry, what is to be done? Referring to the evil that is rolled across this country like a dark storm cloud. What is to be done? And those, those were his exact words. And they stuck in my head because it, it reminds me of arguably the most influential novel of the 19th century in Russia. It's almost completely forgotten in the West, maybe even forgotten in Russia today. But it is a novel that was published in 1863 by that very name, What is to be Done. Now, it's not to be confused with a book written by Vladimir Lenin, published in what I think 1904, called by the same title, What is to be Done. Lenin very self-consciously took the title, appropriated the title from the earlier work of fiction. But that work of fiction was published by a guy by the name, written and published by a guy by the name of Nicholas um, Chernyshevsky. And Chernyshevsky was a Russian socialist revolutionary. He was arrested, imprisoned in the Peter and Paul Fortress. I've been in there. It's, uh, it could be a, a very harrowing place. It's in St. Petersburg. But he was imprisoned there, and while he was imprisoned there, the authorities didn't let him continue to write his revolutionary tracts. So he petitioned, uh, petitioned the governor of the fortress, may I write a novel? Can I dedicate my literary energies to writing a novel? And they said, yeah, sure. It's fine, you write a novel. He goes, it's a romance. And it is, in part. But what is to be done would become one of the most dangerous books of all time. Um, not only did they let him write it, but the prison censors decided this isn't a problem and they passed it on. And then the censors for what was allowed to be published in Russia. Russia has always had censors. <laughs> Free speech is not a thing in Russia, never has been. They decided it was okay for publication. And what is to be done quickly became a classic among Russians. Now, some of you will say, yeah, but what about Tolstoy? What about Dostoevsky? What about Turgenev? What about all these other Pushkin? What about all these other writers? Weren't they more influential in Russia? The answer is no, they weren't. They were vastly influential outside of Russia and influential within it. But Chernyshevsky's What is to be Done outpaced them all in terms of its influence. And it's because the novel itself, it makes a hero of its central or one of its characters by the name of Rachmatov. And Rachmatov is this socialist revolutionary. He's, he's, he's almost religious in his, no, he is religious in his commitment to revolution. He sleeps on a bed of nails. He denies himself 
all good things, no love, no sex, no good food. The one guilty pleasure he allows himself are fine cigars, and he does feel guilty for it. He sees it as a kind of weakness. He's totally devoted to the revolution. He loves people, but in the abstract, not his neighbor. And this is the way the leftists work. This is the way they think. Dostoevsky and Tolstoy would read this novel, and they would you know, um, you know, kind of make fun of the kind of character here, but they would recognize that Rachmatov, who becomes a kind of type, a model for socialist revolutionaries in Russia and without Russia, that this is a guy who is dangerous. This is a type of person who is dangerous. Another thing about this character is that he worships science. He doesn't, he sees all morality as artificial human construct doesn't accept it, doesn't believe in God. He's atheistic to his core. He thinks science can provide all the answers. This should start sounding familiar to you. There's a reason why I refer to the character of Rachmatov, because Rachmatov is the kind of person we're seeing today. And part of what I want you to understand in, in telling you this is that what must cause the woke mind virus, it isn't new. These kind of people have existed for millennia. They appear from time to time, but those who are possessed of the, the fascist or the socialist mind virus, they, they're a, a particularly virulent strain of a virus. Have you guys ever tried talking to somebody who is possessed of this thinking? Do you, do you see how almost impossible it is to reach a mind like this? They're not reasonable. And we will come back to this. And, and, and I want to say this about science, because why Rachmatov really comes to my mind, and this, again, it's a little book you can find online, probably a books. You might be able to find it on, uh, on Amazon. It is called What is to be Done by Chernyshevsky, Nikolai Chernyshevsky. And it's not very big. It's an easy read, but it will give you, some of you are asking me for book recommendations, it will give you insight into the woke mind, a 19th century insight into the woke mind. Uh, are you guys familiar with something called scientism? S scientism is the idea that science can provide all the answers. Science can provide all the answers. And Rachmatov is guilty of scientism, and the woke mob is guilty of scientism. And it's important that we understand this. I recall years ago at MIT, I was listening to a lecture. I was there listening to a lecture by uh, Dr. Jerome Kagan. Jerome Kagan was, uh, he's deceased now, but he's Jewish. Uh, chair of the Department of Philosophy, I think, at, um, or excuse me, of psychology at Harvard University. But he was giving a lecture on science. And he said this, um, he said, we must... I mean, again, this is 20 years ago, maybe more than that. He was saying we have to fight the tendency to allow science to dictate everything. And he says, just because science says it can be done doesn't mean we should be done. It should be done. And you certainly cannot derive morality from science. You know, it's been said that um, science can tell us how to build an atomic bomb. It can't tell us how to use one. And Kagan said, if you think science should be the basis of morality, I want you to go home today and tell your wife that. Tell her that according to science, men are by nature promiscuous and see how she reacts to that. Or does she think you should perhaps deny science? So he says, we deny science all the time and we have to continue to do so. But that's not the way the woke mob thinks. So here are some general principles for you to understand, if you want to reach someone who is possessed by the woke mentality, these are things you need to understand. First, you must understand that their attachment to the woke agenda is emotional, not intellectual. Now, I'm a football fan, and I'm an Alabama football fan, and if I were to tell you that my team has more national championships than your team. And I don't care who your team is. Alabama has more. If I were to tell you that my team has, has more players in the NFL than yours, and again, I don't care who your team is, my, my team has more. 
And if I were to lay out all these reasons, intellectual reasons, why you should say, roll tide, I'm a Bama fan. Have I convinced you? Have I moved you? Have those of you who are out there who are Georgia fans or Ohio State fans or USC fans or Auburn fans, have I convinced you to become an Alabama fan? Well, of course I haven't. And that's because your allegiance to your team isn't intellectual, it's emotional. Now, just using that, something like sports, imagine how difficult it is to convince someone whose mind has been infected by the woke mind virus to give that up. It's going to be very, very hard. And that's because their commitment to it is emotional, not intellectual. Not only that, but they've even been taught not to think and to shut down attempts to reason with them. Oh, a year or two ago, I was speaking at a, um, a university, a Christian university, a very large Christian university. And I was even speaking to students who were in the department of ministry. So these are future pastors that I'm talking to. So I go in there thinking I'm talking to the home crowd. I'm used to speaking to um, hostile groups. Don't mind it. But on this occasion, I'm thinking, ah, oh, great. These are all people who are, they're all fellow Christians. They're all people who believe the Bible. And I begin to sense dis a disturbance in the force, as it were. As I can tell, their professor is becoming very agitated about what I'm talking about. And you know what got him agitated? I made a, a passing reference to abortion as being an evil, as being sin. It wasn't the subject of my talk. I just simply made reference to it. And he became quite agitated over this. And he began attempting to shut down my lecture, told me that I was not allowed to speak anymore. I couldn't say anything. And that he turned to his students and he began saying to these students, don't listen to him, don't listen to him. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You can't shut down my lecture like that. I mean, let's have a conversation. You tell me where I'm biblically wrong. I mean, you asked me, you invited me to come and speak to these students and I've rooted everything I've said in Scripture, which is supposed to be the basis of our commonality. It may not be the basis of my relationship with some of you who watch this podcast, because I know many of you are not Christians. Many of you are Muslims. Many of you are atheists. But we can still find some commonality somewhere. But with a fellow Christian, the basis of our interactions, of our agreements or disagreements, has to be Scripture. That's, that's the way the rules work. But he didn't want to hear that. And he kept telling his students not to hear that. In other words, he had, he had conditioned his students to react emotionally rather than process intellectually. And I have to tell you, as somebody who has spoken on the campuses of universities, colleges and universities, high schools, prep schools all over the world, a generation ago, 15, 20 years ago, when I was in discussion, um, and, you know, I, uh, listen, I prefer to be on campuses that are secular. I don't, again, I don't mind speaking to um, audiences that are, um, that are hostile to the Christian faith. It doesn't bother me at all. But used to, during the Q&A, I'd give a presentation, there'd be a Q&A, and students would line up at the mics, and they would come to the mics maybe full of emotion, but where they're ready to argue with you. Okay, fight me. I could take it. But now they don't do that. Now they try to shut you down. I received an invitation last year from some sort of prestigious literary group in Palm Beach, Florida, primarily Jewish, that had asked me to come and speak on my book around the world in more than 80 days. They have an academic in that group who pushed them to disinvite me. And I said... Let's bring him up on stage. Let's bring him up. I'll be glad to go at it with him. I'll be glad to have a discussion with him. I'll be glad to hear his objections to a presentation that I haven't yet even given. <laughs> he is objecting to a presentation I've not yet given. And the irony of this is, again, he's a university professor. The university, a place of the exchange of ideas. That's what they're supposed to be driven by. You would think of anybody, but nope, he wanted to shut it down. 
because he did not want that group to hear an opinion contrary to his own. He seems he has some authority and probably has some prestige among them. When, uh, hearing that that was the case, I thought, I want to come all the more now because I'd love to knock the stuffing out of him in discussion. I want to expose him for the fraud that he is. But see, that's not the way they think. The woke mind virus is about shutting you down. Number two, you have to understand you're dealing with people who have no absolute moral foundation, only moral sentiment, and there is a difference. You have to understand that difference. Some of you will object to me saying that they have no absolute moral foundation. It's obvious. It's obvious. It's why someone can go from thinking and never even countenancing the possibility of irreversible sex change surgeries on adolescents to going, this is a moral good and should be done. I find myself encountering people who I know would have called this a great evil five years ago who now justify it. And the reason is because they're all sale, no anchor, morally speaking. They have no absolute foundation. And because they have no absolute moral foundation, it makes hijacking their vague moral sentiments that much easier. It's what I call Christian-ish. Christian-ish. If your Christian faith, so-called, is not actually rooted in the word. It's not actually rooted in scripture. And by the way, this is true. If you're, if you're Jewish, if you're a, a Muslim, if your faith, whatever it is, isn't actually rooted in your holy scriptures, then all you have is some sort of vague religious idealism. And it's how churches have been hijacked so easily. Because if you believe something like God is love, and that's some sort of absolute um, moral standard off of which you, you live, actually, I shouldn't say absolute moral standard, but some sort of vague sentiment off of which you live, then you'll find yourself endorsing all kinds of evil. That the idea of God is love or God's love has to have context. And that context is given to us in the Bible itself. There are guardrails on that. God, the, the Bible also says God hates. Did you know that? Some of you didn't. Did you know Jesus talked about hell more than he talked about heaven? I mean, that's the red letters <laughs> in, 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 in the Bible. He talked about judgment. But see, the whole God is love crowd, they're not aware of the red letters in Scripture. No, they're not aware of that. And it's because their Christian faith isn't a real Christian faith. It isn't an authentic Christian faith. It's Christian-ish. And that's how those sentiments become hijacked. It's Elon Musk's tweet of a week or so ago that said he's not opposed to, if, if, two, if two consenting adults love each other, they should be able to pursue that no, no matter what the circumstances of that are. And Jordan Peterson quite rightly came back at him and said, this is dangerous. This is dangerous because you're not giving. And, and I was actually surprised by that because Peterson says quite a few things that I think are kind of a mixed bag. And that's because Peterson himself does not have an absolute moral basis. And by the way, I like Jordan Peterson. If you're watching, I'm flattered. But... I wish that you would give your life to Jesus Christ, but we'll come to back to that. Perhaps that's a private conversation we can have on some occasion. Avoid the Christian-ish, but you must understand that these are often people who are have no absolute moral standard. So what do you think a lot of people are using love in a vague way? What do you think they actually mean? The question is, what, what do I think people actually mean when they say God is love? I, I, I don't think they even know what they mean. I think, again, it's sort of vague sentimentality. It's just this idea that we're supposed to be nice to all people and accept all agendas. And so the result becomes diversity for diversity's sake. Diversity for diversity's sake, which is, you know, there's the, the idea of diversity of strength is nonsense, right? I mean, the, uh, you know, Greek homogeneity, you know, defeated um, 
Persian diversity at Marathon. <laughs> I mean, they couldn't even speak the same languages. They, their armies couldn't really even communicate with each other. And the, uh, the, the Greeks could. They had a shared culture. They had a shared identity. They had a shared um, idea of what it was they were defending and fighting for. Not so with the Persians. Most of them were fighting, you know, under the lash. And so I, I, think, I think when people say things like God is love, they don't really even know what they mean by that. It just, it's just a way of punting on issues. And it's a way, by the way, that the, the cynical types easily use that. Because if such a person voices, gosh, I'm not sure that, that endorsing the whole alphabet mafia agenda is a good thing. They'll say, so you don't think you, you, you don't think that people should be allowed to love each other. And those people don't have a response to that. They don't know what, they don't know what to say about that. Number three, the woke types view the past history, all received wisdom with contempt. Now, there is a reason why 12 books of the Old Testament are histories. God thought it was important. Psalm 78, 3 and 4 says, Things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord, of his might, and of the wonders that he has done. Deuteronomy 32, 7 says, Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations, ask your father, and he will show you, your elders, and they will tell you. This is a command to remember the past, to remember the past, <clears throat> to repeat them generationally. Deuteronomy 6, 7 says, and you shall teach them when they rise up, when they lie. It's, it's, you shall teach your children. You shall tell them of the great deeds, the things that God has done. What is the Lord's Supper? If it isn't, and this isn't, I'm not making a statement here, by the way, about a view of the sacrament. There are several views of the Lord's Supper. There's transubstantiation, consubstantiation, memorialism, and spiritual presence. I'm not making commentary on that. What all four views hold is this. They all believe that it is to be done, as Christ said, in remembrance of me. It's a way of remembering. History matters. Remember, when I put that sacrament in my mouth, when I put the bread and the wine in my mouth, I say to myself, my salvation is as real as this bread, it's as real as this wine in my mouth, because he's already accomplished this deed on the cross. He's already done it. Remember, Larry, your salvation is real. It is an accomplished fact. It's history. It's been done. This is why we have Memorial Day, the 4th of July, which we just celebrated, Veterans Day. It's a time to reflect, a time to remember what was done on our behalf as a nation. I love what Edmund Burke, Edmund Burke, by the way, uh, again, some of you want book recommendations. He is a hero of mine. And he still, it's, it's a little stilted, the language can be. It's 18th century language. But it's still beautifully written and the ideas are powerful. Edmund Burke was an Anglo-Irish philosopher, political theorist, parliamentarian, British parliamentarian, a force. And he said in his Reflections on the Revolution in France, which is published in, I think, 1791, he said this, people will not look forward to posterity who never look backward to their ancestors. That's terrific. You cannot build a future for posterity if you haven't looked back to your ancestors. You must understand the past. And these are individuals, the woke mind is indifferent to history. It's why they do the things that they do. People ask, why would anyone want to resurrect ideas like socialism and fascism and see them as a kind of societal blueprint when those ideologies have killed no less than 150 million people in the 20th century alone? Well, the answer to the question is, they don't know that history. They don't know it. Now, the puppet masters, they do know it, and they're arrogant enough to believe it can be 
you know, it, it can be revamped and remodeled in a way that'll make it workable. Of course, it never is workable. But the reason that there are many young people who think this stuff will work is because they're utterly ignorant of its history, of the body bags that it leaves in its wake. That's why. So the point here is that history is important. The Lord thought it was important. The people of Israel built memorials to remember the past. They had feast days to remember the past. They gave place names to remember the past. So looking to the past gives us some clarity, some direction on the future. And by the way, I will add here that I believe that history is more important than science. If you had to choose, and you don't, but if you had to choose to teach one or the other over your children, teach them history. It will give moral direction to them. Reading good biographies, good histories, gives you examples in history. It gives you wisdom. Science cannot depart wisdom. Science can give us some cool stuff and has. It can send man to the moon. History can't do that for you. But it is better that you have moral anchor than that you be able to make the salad shooter. It's just, it's just more important. It really is. So these are people who look solely to the future, to the utopia they will build. And that brings me to my next point, which is they're utopians. The woke mind is infected by the idea of building a utopia. Now, utopians, as I have said in other podcasts, have killed more people than all religious wars combined. But from the Tower of Babel to the World Economic Forum, utopians are, as I have said, the Homeowners Association, the HOA from hell. The average person wakes up in the morning, grabs a cup of coffee, and starts thinking about what they're going to do that day. The utopian, who are leftists, and by the way, all utopians are leftists. The utopians also wake up in the morning, grab a cup of coffee, but they're thinking about how to organize your day too. They're worried about what you might be doing. They're determined, like an HOA from hell, they are determined to control what you do. The idea for utopians that someone somewhere is free and happy and doing what they want to do is an intolerable thought for them. And it's because they're possessed by the idea of reorganizing humanity according to their warped utopian principles. Why does utopia appeal when so many attempts at building it have resulted in mass graves? Well, I think that part of the appeal of utopia is that it can never disappoint them. It can never disappoint them. In the revolutionary's mind, if things turn out badly, and they always do turn out badly, they're able to convince themselves that so-and-so did it wrong. Lenin did it wrong, or Stalin did it wrong. Klaus Schwab did it wrong. Bill Gates did it wrong. Mao did it wrong. And if they work just a little harder, sacrifice a little more, and get rid of just a few more people <laughs> who are impeding progress, utopia will be in reach. This is the way these people think. Number five, there are members of a secular religion that bear strong resemblance to ancient paganism a secular religion, in some ways that's a contradiction, that's an oxymoron. Secular religion. But it is fascinating to me that utopian, secular utopian ideologies often take on religious symbolism. Lenin's mausoleum. I've been through there several times to see the dead maniac, you know, who I love the way P.J. O'Rourke put it. He says, um, who lays under glass like a bad salad under a sneeze guard. <laughs> it's mostly wax these days. You should go through and see Lenin's mausoleum. They've given it a very religious, he's a saint of this secular religion of socialism. 
and how they begin worshiping their dead leaders as kind of secular saints. This is what they do. Romans 1 speaks of pagan religion as taking the place of God and having these characteristics, the worship of nature, the dishonoring of bodies, homosexuality, and then finally it says God gave them up. Three times it says it. God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave them up. That God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done, meaning it's just anything goes. So again, worship of nature, dishonoring of bodies. Is dishonoring of bodies happening now? What we're seeing again being done to adolescents, what we're seeing adults do to themselves in denying the way that God created them. There's no such thing as, as someone being trapped in the wrong body. It's not true. It's a lie. It's a lie, it's a lie scientifically. It is a lie uh, according to the Christian faith. It just simply isn't true. The worship of nature, is that happening? Sure it is. The World Economic Forum is in large part driven by the idea not of bettering humankind, but in saving the planet. And if you think those two are, are one and the same, they absolutely are not. They absolutely are not. Look up something called degrowth. We'll bring that up in a future podcast. Degrowth. See what that's all about. That whole agenda is all about. It's what you're seeing. It's about the destruction of the American economy European economies as well, uh, as well that for the purpose of slowing capitalism and growth for the planet. It's what's driving this idea of putting sails on cargo ships. What complete idiocy of getting rid of your gas stove, of getting rid of your petrol-driven automobiles. It's what's driving that. It's about not raising the standard of living in the rest of the world, but bringing the standard of living of the United States down to the rest of the world. This is what's driving them. So when it looks to you like, gosh, it seems like it's on purpose to sort of destroy the economy. It's because it is. It is on purpose. They hide it. In their, Biden seems to tweet almost every day how many jobs he's created. It's a lie. It's smoke and mirrors. This is not what they're about. So the worship of nature, the dishonoring of bodies, homosexuality, we mainstreamed that a, you know, a decade ago, and a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Anything goes. We are absolutely seeing this. And Romans 1 says they will do it all while claiming to be wise. That's a direct quotation from Romans 1. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. We're seeing individuals who claim to be wise, claim to be driven by science, follow the science, we hear, but they're actually fools. I have made reference to you on a, a previous podcast or two, certainly in some tweets. Follow me on Twitter, make sure you do, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, a guy by the name of Lev Kopolev, this guy right here. This is part of a trilogy but this book is titled The Education of a True Believer. Now, so that you'll know a little bit of who he is, I, I love reading this guy. He's a lesser known version of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, a Russian dissident writer. But there's, there's such honesty in his writing and um, full of shame, you know, for the things that he himself did. But Kapolev was born, I want to say that he was born in 1912, maybe. But he was a guy that was a young man at the time of so many of the tremendous evils that the Soviets were committing against their own people in the 1930s, you know, the, the great purges and so on. And he was, when he says the education of a true believer, he's talking about himself. He says, I was a true believer. I was so bought into, my term, woke ideology I was so bought into it, the, the woke mind virus had so taken over my thinking that I committed great evils against people in the confidence that I was morally justified in doing it. And here's what he says. Again, we're talking about how wokedom takes on kind of religious aspects. We saw this in talking about Chernyshevsky's, you know, what is to be done. Rachmatov is a religious ascetic or an anti-religious ascetic. Kapolev says this in his memoir, we were raised the fanatical adepts of a new creed, 
the only true religion of scientific socialism. Note science. The party became our church militant, bequeathing to all mankind eternal salvation, eternal peace, and the bliss of an earthly paradise, utopia. The works of Marx, Engels, and Lenin were accepted as holy writ, and Stalin, the infallible high priest. Wow. This is what's happening now. And he tells on himself that I went around doing committing great evils against people, but always sure that it was for the betterment of mankind. And he says the phrase that drove us, that was always used, is historical necessity. He said, we always acted on behalf of historical necessity. Today, historical necessity, that phrase has been replaced by sustainability. Sustainability. Just type in that word, and it will bring up every woke agenda for you. They're all using it. And that word should become freighted for you with great evils. Anytime you hear sustainability, there's evil that's coming <laughs> right behind it. It's right behind it. It is the, it is the, um, you know, the semi um, that's pulling the trailer of evil. That's, that's what it is. That's what sustainability is. These are individuals who are full of their own self-righteousness. It is often wrongly assumed that self-righteousness is a characteristic of religion, specifically of the Christian faith, but this simply isn't so because self-righteousness has no place in the Christian's life. It doesn't. You know, it, it, it dawned on me one time when I'm mowing of all things. Some of my best thoughts come to me sitting on a riding lawnmower. I'm mowing for hours. And like a lightning bolt, this thought came to me. I'll attribute it to the Holy Spirit. Larry, self-righteousness is the greatest evil of all. And that is because there is no no sin in hell that will not be reflected in heaven. Meaning there will be no one in hell who has committed a sin that someone in heaven hasn't also committed, save one. And that's self-righteousness. And that's because a self-righteous man will never ask for forgiveness because he thinks he doesn't need it. And he will never grant it because he is sure you don't deserve it. That's self-righteousness. That's self-righteousness. Hell will be full of self-righteous people. Has no place in the life of the Christian. No, self-righteousness is a product of the human heart. Some of the most self-righteous people I have ever met were absolutely possessed by secular uh, ideologies. Have you ever met the recycling Nazis? The mask Nazis? Those are self-righteous people. The vax mandate Nazis, again, whether or not you take a vaccine or not isn't for me to decide, that is a personal choice. I'm seeing now these days people who who are very self-righteous about not taking it. Don't be that way. It's a, it's a personal choice. But whichever side of that you're on, you're being very self-righteous when you are trying to dunk on individuals and say, you need to do what I did. It's a personal, it's a personal choice. Kapolev said this, speaking of self-righteousness, and he said it in this book, actually right here. This book, you can't see the title there, but it's called To Be Preserved Forever, also by Kapolev. I belong to the one and only righteous party. I was a fighter in a just war for the victory of the historically most progressive class and hence the ultimate happiness of all mankind. And by the way, I want to refer to something here towards the end of the book, which I think is so important where he's talking about this. Pardon me for one second. I'll pull it up here. Just a second. I've almost got it. I almost got it. Where is it? Ah, He says this, Therefore, I had to be ready to sacrifice my life at a moment's notice and to demand any sacrifice from my comrades and friends. And of course, I could not show mercy to the enemy or have pity for neutrals. In the sacred struggle being waged by many millions of people, the fate of one person or of a hundred thousand was mathematically insignificant. That isn't what Kapolev believed at the time of writing that. He's explaining what was in his head at that time. If we have to sacrifice a few people 
or a hundred thousand people, it's for the betterment of mankind. This is the way these people think. Human beings are just raw material for the building of the secular utopia. Number six, membership in the woke mob makes them feel safe. It makes them feel safe because they feel like they're part of the majority. Rarely are they actually the majority. They're just a part of those people who are in power. But it makes them feel safe. It's the psychology of the collaborator. I said in a recent tweet that the majority of French collaborated with the occupying Germans during World War II. They did. We know this. Why? Felt safer. Number seven, it makes them feel part of something bigger than themselves. Zachary, you said something very interesting. My son Zachary is sitting off set over here, and he is a, you're barely a millennial, almost a Gen Zer, isn't that right? So you said something about your own generation that I thought was kind of profound as it relates to this. Why don't you say that for us? Use that mic right there. Yeah. Um, so we've all grown up in a world with, you know, movies and social media and all this stuff. And lots of people in my generation want their lives to be like a movie. But in the absence of any real drama, because we've all grown up in such a privileged world, tons of people I know are just inventing drama. They're elevating things that don't really matter up to these levels just to create constant drama just because... Frankly, they're obsessed with it and thrive on it. They want their own civil rights movement or their own World War II or their own 60s Vietnam protests. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true because it makes them feel a part of something bigger than themselves. I, I remember Christopher Hitchens saying that uh, in his own communist uh, atheist days in the 1960s, he said it was an intoxicating feeling that you are a part of the engine of history. And um, that's how these people think. Number eight, they are godless. Some of you may say, well, my son, he's woke. No, he believes in God. Not really. Not really. Doesn't mean he's an outright atheist or declares himself to be an atheist. It means that what he believes is not actually rooted in any holy text. It's not rooted in the Bible. And if you question me about this, try even, this applies equally to the woke people in the church. Try getting those people into scripture. It's a very interesting thing. When I encounter these types, and I have many times, just as I said in front of this classroom of students, I want to say, well, let's look at what the text says. You think that I've said something wrong here in saying that abortion is evil. Let's look at the Bible. Let's look at it together. You make your case, I'll make mine. They will not do that. They do not want to do that because it threatens their Christian-ish stand. It's much easier to deceive people with language like, I noticed this with a pastor um, that I, I had some very unpleasant encounters with who used language like this to a congregation. He would say things like this, we must listen to the heart of God. That's very deceptive, very seductive because it sounds so good. But what does it mean? It's absent any actual substance. It could be good or it could be bad. If the heart of God that you're talking about, you mean you're actually talking about looking at what is written in Scripture, that's one thing. Otherwise, you can say that and make up your own stuff. Let's listen to the heart of God. This kind of thinking. These are individuals who do not want to get into the absolutes of Scripture. They want to avoid it. Uh, on that, Harry Reader, um, actually, are you saying Harry Reader was woke? <laughs> no. <laughs> just kidding. We're just joking. Harry Reader's the local pastor who um, I thought very highly of. I knew Harry. He was the senior pastor of a mega church here, Briarwood Presbyterian Church. And by the way, was about as unwoke as any human being you'd ever meet. Love, Terry. He's talking about that kind of feelings-oriented Christianity. Like, well, let's just feel what God wants for us. He said, I love this quote, he said, if you want to, to hear the voice of God audibly, read the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> if you, Harry said, if you want to hear the voice of God audibly, read the Bible out loud. That's that's brilliant. That's genius. Um, we, uh, we wish... Very well to, um, to Harry's family 
uh, in this time of mourning. We, uh, we lost a great man when Harry Reeder was tragically killed in an automobile accident about a month ago. And, um, uh, and I know that many are feeling that loss. Number nine, they're convinced that they are either victims or saviors. People who are infected by the woke mind virus think of themselves as either victims or saviors. Both are very strong with these people because they've been convinced of their own victimhood or they've been convinced of the victimhood of other people. This is what you're seeing in this kind of, this kind of condescending racism of Dan Cathy that we, we showed on a, a previous podcast where Dan Cathy, who is the CEO, uh, he's the son of Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A. He is the CEO of Chick-fil-A. And he gets up during a TV show and he goes over and he starts shining the shoes, the sneakers actually, of the host, who is a black man. I mean, it's condescending. But in his mind, he, he appears to think of himself as being you know, so moral, so good in doing something so ridiculous, so obsequious as this. It's disgusting. Because he's convinced of that man's victimhood. Or you're like a woman we played on, uh, on a previous podcast who calls herself the Black Messiah, who is talking about her hate for white people. She has been convinced of her own victim hood, and thus she feels justified in hating. You must understand that about these people. They see themselves as victims or as saviors. The Messiah complex runs deep with these folks. Number 10, they consider nonconformists, people like you and me, perhaps, certainly me, hopefully you, they consider nonconformists to their agenda. Anyone who does not adhere to the woke agenda, they consider them to be dangerous and enemies of the people. You're going to start seeing that phrase before too long. In, in some iteration, enemies of the environment, enemies of the common good, you'll see something like that. Enemies of the people. It's used throughout the communist world. It's a way of separating you out from everyone else and saying, that guy is dangerous. Everyone hate on that guy. Go on your social media and dump hatred on that guy alienate him, make him feel alone. Do not let him participate in polite society. And that's why, as Kapolev says, I could do all the things that I did. I went and took grain, he says, from farmers knowing that they would starve to death because I was convinced in my head, I was convinced in my mind that they were enemies of the people, and they needed to be eradicated. Finally, number 11, you must understand, and hopefully this will give you some compassion for them. You must understand that the rank and file, at least, not the, not the puppet masters, not the engineers, uh, the societal elitists who are driving all of this, but the rank and file who are being used, and they're almost always young people. Young people have always been the tip of the spear in any revolution. They're just cannon fodder. You must understand that these people have been manipulated. And hopefully that will give you some degree of compassion for them. They have been emotionally manipulated. They've been failed by their teachers, their professors. The professor at that class I was speaking to, what an utter disgrace you are, sir. What an utter disgrace you are. They've been failed by their teachers and their professors and often, but though not always, by their parents. Some parents live with a lot of guilt. I want to say this by word of encouragement to you. Some of you should. Some of you have, have been awful parents. You did not train up your children rightly. Look to God's grace. Look to his forgiveness for that failure. He'll grant it. But others of you have endeavored to train up your ch children rightly, and they've gone in the wrong direction. I remind you of this. God, who is the most perfect parent, to quote Charles Swindoll, has the most errant children. <laughs> he has the most wayward children. So sometimes perfect parents and fabulous teachers still produce failures. Jesus, who was perfect, who was a perfect teacher and a perfect man, it was God-made man. 
he had Judas in his midst. Judas in his midst. Do we blame Jesus for Judas? Of course not. So don't beat yourself up too badly on, on this and endeavor, endeavor to right the wrong if you can. If you have young children, do not turn your children over to the state to be educated. I do not see any injunction in Scripture where the children of Israel were handed over to the Philistines for education. That's, in fact, is what you're doing. My wife and I, some of you will say, well, I can't afford to homeschool. My wife and I lived off of about $25,000 a year while we homeschooled. We had almost nothing. <laughs> this, this is a true story. I would occasionally come home with a sweet tea, you know, drive, go through a drive through <laughs> And I would get home and my wife would say, where'd you get that? I'd say, well, I, I found some change in the ashtray. <laughs> it was a buck 50. She said, yeah, but we needed milk. I mean, in other words, that was, that was our situation, but we were that committed to homeschooling our children. Now, there are gradations of woke people. They're not all the extreme. You have, for instance, say, an individual like Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Read Gulag Archipelago. Solzhenitsyn was not a Christian, but he wasn't ever a real ardent socialist, a communist. He's arrested, sent to the Gulag. He eventually becomes a Christian. He is convinced of the Christian faith. He converts when a Jewish convert to the Christian faith shares the gospel with him. He was somebody who was more reachable. Then you have individuals like Kapolev. It took him 10 years in prison before he gave up on communist philosophy on the woke ideology that had infected his mind. He was in prison <laughs> during his time in prison. He even wondered, is this a test of the state to see if I'm really a faithful communist? Is this a way of really trying to determine how dedicated I am to the revolutionary cause? So sold out was he, so bought in to the Stalinist agenda that he, even while <laughs> the very people he was championing was defending, even while he was in prison and they're punishing him for imaginary offenses, he defended them for a decade. And he said, it took that long for me to finally come to my senses and to realize I was wrong. Then we come to a woman, and I don't think I have her book up here, but her name is, it's a fascinating book. It's a book called Journey into the Whirlwind. And the author of the book is Eugenia Semyonovna Ginsburg. Ginsburg, Journey into the Whirlwind. It's a fascinating story of how she was arrested during the Stalinist purges, arrested in 1934. On the wake of the, um, in the wake of the assassination of Sergei Kirov. She was accused of all kinds of offenses, again, an enemy of the people. And she spent, I don't know, 15 years in prison, maybe more, probably more like 20 years. But you know what's the very disappointing part of that book is you get to the very end, you read the last page and you close the book and you go, I think she's still a communist. I don't think she ever learned anything from what she's been through here. I, I think she still believes in this nonsense. So here's our gradation. You know, when we're talking about woke individuals, people who you might reach, people you might reach out to, on the one hand, there's individuals like Alexander Solzhenitsyn who through a conversation with a convert to the Christian faith, he becomes a Christian. Then there's guys like Kapolev, who it took years and years and years of hard experience before he ever gave up on the evil ideology that he had adopted as his own. And then on the far end is someone like Ginsburg, who never gave up on it, it doesn't seem. Either that, there is the possibility that she just didn't want to admit it in her memoir because she still was living in the Soviet Union. She was released after... Uh, Stalin's death in March of 1953 and Stalin came, excuse me, and Khrushchev came to power. Maybe she was still afraid to say that. But the point is there, there are gradations of these individuals. I would urge you not to throw pearls before swine. 
Some people just need to be defeated. You think in your head, you know, if I can just sit down with, with, with my, my colleague or my son or daughter or um, my friend, have a good cup of coffee, we can discuss all this and I can help them to see that this woke nonsense they bought into is just that, it's nonsense. There's some people you will not make a dent in their thinking and it's not even worth trying. It doesn't mean that they won't eventually come around. Maybe they will. But there are some people who just need to be defeated because you cannot convince them. And don't throw pearls before swine. You know, the Apostle Paul was just such a person. I get, we could say that in some sense he was infected by a mind virus, convinced that what he was doing was what God wanted him to do. Jesus said in um, John 16, he said, there will be those who will kill you in my name. They will kill you in my name. They will claim that what they're doing is on my behalf. That's a reference to people like Paul. Paul was this kind of individual. Do I think that you could have sat down with Paul and convinced him to give up the evil that he believed? I don't. It took the Damascus Road experience, it took direct intervention from God recorded in Acts 9 before he changed. Some people are like that. It just requires that. It requires that they hit rock bottom before they begin to look up. So the, you know, the Bible does provide us with an example of this kind of thinking. Now, there are some of you who ask, what can I do? And again, in this podcast, it's not my purpose to depress you and to lay out a bunch of stuff that makes you feel like slitting your wrists and sitting in a warm bathtub. That's not my goal. My goal is to equip you, to encourage you, to mobilize you. That's the goal of this podcast. And that's why I'm giving you this today. I want you to understand how these people think. They don't think like you. They don't think like normal people. For them, you are simply a barrier. You're the embodiment of either a good idea or a bad idea. You are the embodiment of an idea that is for the betterment of the planet or for humanity or for something like that, or you are someone who embodies an idea that is an impediment to what is good for the people, what is good for the planet. That is the way they think. So you ask me, what can I do? Now, we're thinking in this podcast, we're thinking as a staff, as a crew, as friends, about a really, really good answer to this question about how you can act as a whole. And again, I want to give you a name. The people who follow this podcast I haven't been able to come up with anything yet, but something clever. As I say, Rush called the people who watched it or listened to his show, Ditto Heads, want to come up with something clever for that. We want to give you a good action item. But till then, till then, these are a few things you can do. Pray. God wants to be asked. He does want to be asked, and I believe he's ready to act on behalf of his people. We need to bring him into the conversation. That is important. Engage your friends and neighbors. Engage them. Push back. Let your, let your representatives feel the weight of your vote and of your voice. Be a pest. Be a pest. Let them know what you will and won't tolerate. Hold them accountable. You can do this. And then you say to yourself, but I'm just one person. I watched this weekend a wonderful documentary unrelated to this. <clears throat> you should watch it. It's called Spitfire. It's been done in the last year or so. It's about the, the British airplane during World War II. It is beautifully filmed. The cinematography is just stunning in watching these planes, which are works of art, flying. But it's telling the story of the Spitfire and its role in World War II, and specifically its role in the Battle of Britain, you know, where Churchill said, never in the field of human conflict has so much been owed by so many to so few. He was referring to the pilots who fought in the Battle of Britain against overwhelming odds, and they fought very successfully. But the, but the documentary interviews, those few Spitfire pilots are still alive or people who, you know, who helped on the assembly line building them or this kind of thing. And one person said this, he was talking about the role of the Spitfire. 
And he was talking about the heavy bombers, you know, that the, that the Germans, the Nazis sent during the Battle of Britain across the channel to bomb cities like Coventry and London. They're called Heinkels, Heinkels, or the German aircraft. And he says this, I saw three Spitfires fly into a formation of 500 Heinkels and scatter the lot of them. <laughs> it's terrific. He says, 500 planes. And he said, I saw three Spitfires go straight at them and scatter the whole lot. That should inspire you. The point is that God can use you, that he's ready to use you, just as he was ready to use David, who arrived on the field of battle to find the armies of Israel trembling in their trenches. And he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And do you remember what the response was to David? You're arrogant. There'll be people who'll say that to you. People say that to me. How dare you, Larry, say that? Such arrogance to think that you can make a difference. <laughs> it's not in my own strength that I believe that. I believe in a big God. I believe in a God who will use me. I believe he'll use me in this podcast. I'll use, I believe he'll use me in other ways too. If I'm prepared to believe in him and to act on that, and I would encourage you to do the same thing.